Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Sonny Bonani, Dumela, and Khedach. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, which is a case study of the Ivan Parsola electric generating system. My name is Daniel Schwab, and I'm the moderator and host for today's webinar. And uh, we'll get started in just a few minutes, uh, but while we're waiting, uh, I'd like to just go over a few housekeeping notes. If you have a question at any time during the presentation or during the Q&A session at the end, please email them using the WebEx window on the right-hand side of your screen. So today's presentation is being recorded and is scheduled to run about 30 minutes, and we'll leave about 10 to 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end. Uh, everyone who participates in today's webinar will receive a link to download a high-resolution photo book of Ivanpah and comprised of some stunning images taken by two world-class photographers, Jamie Stillings and Giles Mingerson. May I ask that you please uh, keep your phones on mute for the duration of the presentation. And as mentioned, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, send, send it through the WebEx. So with that, let's get started. Uh, first up, I'd like to introduce uh, today's speaker, Joe Desmond from Bright Source Energy. Joe is the Senior Vice President of Marketing and Government Affairs. Joe brings three decades of private and public energy sector experience to his role at BrightSource. In particular, Joe served in numerous executive roles under California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, including Deputy Secretary of Energy for the State Resources Agency and Chairman of the California Energy Commission and Under Secretary for Energy Affairs. So in today's webinar, we'll cover many different aspects of the Ivanpah project from start to finish, including technology aspects, construction, operations, and we'll also touch on the financing process. But before that, I'd like to just go into why CSP matters for South Africa. And as you can see on the slide, we've summarized the current situation. We have three projects under construction and two at financial close. Beyond that, there's approximately 1,400 megawatts of projects under development today. And in addition, the South African government is planning a one gigawatt solar park, with a large portion of that going to CSP. So these are the reasons why CSP today ranked South Africa the number one market globally in 2013. And it's quite remarkable, considering that all of this has been achieved within a three-year period. So why is CSP so important to South Africa? Well, in this slide, we've shown the demand, the demand curve, and uh, CSP combined with storage can shift energy production towards the evening peak demand, and again, during the early morning peak period. The flexibility provided by CSP with thermal energy storage is complementary to other clean energy resources, such as PV and wind. In addition, the flexibility is important to meet the country's changing load profile. And most importantly, CSP can play a major role in meeting the country's clean energy goals. So with that short introduction, I'm now going to hand over to Joe Desmond, who will take you through the various phases of getting Ivanpah built. Thank you, Daniel. And I'd like to also thank everyone who's joined here today for this case study on Ivanpah. We're going to, as Daniel indicated, we'll talk about quite a bit of information. But uh, first thing I wanted to do is just make a quick note that the previous slide that Daniel spoke to talked about the value of thermal energy storage and the flexibility that it brings. Uh, it's, it's often asked, why is there not, or why was there not, energy storage at Ivanpah? And there were a few reasons for that. Uh, the first is that in California, where this project was constructed, the state has a renewable portfolio goal of, today it's 33% renewables. Uh, and so at the time that they issued their solicitation for proposals, they were only concerned with getting the m maximum amount of energy, and they were not giving any thought, I should say, or consideration to issues related to flexibility or ramping or reliability or capacity, because at that time they had not seen the uh, start of very high penetration of uh, solar and uh, wind onto the grid. 
that has since changed. Um, virtually every project we're working today around the globe does incorporate thermal storage, whether that is through a combination of a direct steam and storage tanks or a molten salt as a heat transfer fluid. But storage really defines where we're going to be going with the technology and uh, why, as Daniel said, it works so well for California. So uh, with that, let me give you a quick highlight here of what the Ivanpah project looks like from the air. What you can see here, next slide please, Daniel. What you're looking at is an area that is approximately 14 kilometers squared, or if you're in the U.S., 3,500 acres. That is a, a shot taken looking south-northwest uh, with units one, two, and three. Uh, each unit has its own separate power purchase agreement, its own solar field, tower, and receiver, and power block. Uh, each unit also has the is an auxiliary gas boiler, which is used. In total, the unit produces 377 megawatts net, uh, which is about an estimated annual generation of 1,000 gigawatt hours. The project owners uh, for these are uh, NRG Solar, who invested $300 million, Google, who invested $168 million, and BrightSource. But BrightSource was the original developer, uh, the technology provider, and as you'll see uh, when we get into some of the services, um, also is involved in the ongoing operation of the solar field. With respect to who is responsible for starting the project, uh, there's a lot of people involved here um, in different organizations. Uh, from design, it was BrightSource. Uh, we supply the heliostat field, the components, uh, the solar field layout. We'll, we'll go into more detail. Uh, for the SURSIG, or what we call the solar receiver steam generator, Riley Power worked in cooperation with BrightSource to design that. The tower itself was constructed and erected by Bechtel, who served as the engineering procurement and construction management company. The power block is from Siemens uh, and Bechtel uh, with their work. And South Africa would be Alstom. And uh, lastly, NRG uh, served as the managing partner of the holding company, because these are three independent legal entities, each tower with its own uh, contract for 20 or 25 years, uh, but collectively they are managed uh, as a single uh, entity by NRG. So when we think about how do we go and construct a project and what uh, constraints are we looking at? Um, we first have to consider what we know to be available. And so in this example, the Ivanpah site was actually the second site BrightSource had to use from. The first site actually was designated and then had to be reconsidered based on a proposed uh, designation as a national monument. So this is the second site. Uh, it's a great site for a number of reasons. First, uh, it has excellent sun meaning high DNI or what uh, you would normally call direct normal insulation. And that's measured in kilowatt hours per square meter per year. So for this particular area, the southwestern U.S. has typically ranges between 2,600 and 2,900 uh, DNI, uh, kilo, I should say 20 uh, kilowatt hours per square meter per year. South Africa, uh, very close, actually slightly higher. It's uh, generally 2,800 to 3,000, just by way of comparison. Saudi Arabia, 2,400 to 2,600, and uh, uh, different places around the world will have that. The higher the number, though, the more energy capable of being produced from a given location, and as a result, the lower the levelized cost of energy. So we're working with a land that we understand, um, that weather information, uh, we talked about insulation, wind speeds are another factor. In this case, we're in a what's called a high desert area. And so the wind loading that we're required to do for this particular project, uh, those heliostats have to be tested at about 80 miles per hour. And sorry that I don't have that converted immediately to kilometers, but uh, probably close to about 100 kilometers per hour um, on wind loads. And they're stowed in different positions based on the environmental conditions of the day, uh, whether it's raining, um, whether we have heavy winds or in standby during its operation. So in the next slide, you're going to see a picture looking down uh, of the solar receiver steam generator uh, from the top. And there are uh, three components to that. Uh, the white panels are actually protective insulation, the uh, same ceramic insulation that you would think of using as the space shuttle re-enters the atmosphere uh, because these are very high temperatures as they hit the surface there. Uh, the dark is really because when the sun is not always on this, uh, it is a black coating. And so we'll talk about how that technology operates. 
Uh, I think most of you probably, though, uh, are familiar with the fundamentals of a CSP plant. I won't spend much time other than to say you have mirrors reflecting sunlight onto a tower. Uh, in this case, Ivanpah uses water or to create direct steam. It could be molten salt. That steam then is used to produce, to turn a turbine to generate electricity, and you have the option of integrating thermal energy storage. Uh, the first component that, that we focused on is the heliostats. And there's, believe it or not, quite a different range when it comes to heliostats. And for us, it's all about striking a balance between optical efficiency and solar field costs. Because the smaller heliostat, and you can see in the lower left-hand side, some that are just under 2 uh, square meters, uh, all the way up to 120 square meters, Smaller ones provide you with more flexibility, uh, some better layout optimization, and less statistical aiming error. But if it's too small, uh, then you, you do face a lot of drive systems and controllers that are required. And likewise, very large heliostats are going to require more expensive structural support and uh, different uh, access for ongoing maintenance and adjustment uh, when necessary. So the design impacts not only the cost in, in the cost of the field, but also the construction time. And one of the things that uh, we had factored in is the average wind speeds because essentially as you're lowering that heliostat down during a construction, it's like a sail uh, on a sailboat, and it will catch the wind. And so at a certain speed, we had to uh, stop um, simply because it presents a, a safety hazard. But in this example, you can see up above Ivanpah um, with that heliostat. We have since in our next generations now moved to slightly higher, about 19 square meters, uh, but also we moved to wireless control. So one of the changes that uh, you see in projects that as we go forward, but we still use cables here in Ivanpah. Now the solar field is uh, a, a key component. Uh, it should be obvious right away that you're not generally looking at layouts that follow a radial or symmetrical design. Uh, oftentimes we are presented with land that is either sloped land or it is land where there are obstructions, uh, sometimes natural obstructions, sometimes man-made. And so what we're doing is looking and using our software to optimize for that output. Output could be uh, to maximize the energy production at a certain time of the day, and that's why sometimes you'll see these long tails come off uh, of a uh, asymmetric design. But nonetheless, we are able to accommodate that and accommodate the existing slopes. The software will lay out what you see are ring roads on the left-hand corner. Um, we maintain the existing vegetation uh, in place. And uh, you'll see some photos as we get a little deeper. Um, and again, another example of not Ivanpah off to the right, but a different proposal that we have been working on in California shows uh, three towers laid out in a different configuration based on the availability. So um, again, not only do we design for maximum energy input, we are also able to maximize the use of the land that we have, uh, we, again, accommodating slopes up to 10 degrees. So uh, simulation, uh, when we go and we start looking at this, what we're, we're thinking about is how do we optimize design, which is to say, how do we minimize shading? Because shading is simply lost energy. Uh, and we model that across certainly the field, but every hour of the day, given that the sun has different positions across. And so all of this is taken into account, including the natural contours of the land, since the pylons that you'll see that hold these heliostats are always placed at a specific height above the ground. In fact, just continuing here, the GPS and laser system, because precision is a necessary component, we are maintaining accuracy of about 4 millirads from a distance of 1,000 meters. And in fact, the heliostats uh, each have a slightly different curvature, very, very small, but uh, one for 1,000 meters, one for 75, uh, 750, 500, and then 250. And uh, that slight curvature occurs uh, with not having to bend the mirror, but by tightening it and creating that uh, in the assembly process. In this image, though, we are relying on these uh, lasers to scan uh, and understand the positioning. We are taking GPS information about the location of each individual heliostat, and then we use this infrared camera system. So we are doing continuous monitoring of the solar field and calibration on a uh, constant basis um, uh, as we go throughout the day. So let's look a little bit here at the receiver. The solar receiver, uh, this is a 
image I'm going to show you first of our R&D facility uh, when we originally went out and uh, developed this project. And here you see the receiver and a superheater. Uh, as I mentioned, Ivanpah actually has a reheater, although we have found uh, in future designs a reheat function simply is not necessary. But we are using our system to maintain constant monitoring. Uh, the infrared image is uh, helping us to ensure that this is an even distribution of flux across the receiver at any given point in time. And we make those adjustments uh, through the solar field uh, control system that you'll see here in a moment. But looking at that solar receiver, the tower height is 140 meters uh, for each one of these, which is one meter taller than the Great Pyramid of Giza, uh, if you just looking for a point of reference. The three sections I mentioned are the receiver, the superheater, and the reheater. Uh, the temperatures are created are in excess of 538 degrees Celsius, or 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, if you're on a different system, and 160 bar, which is equivalent of 2,300 PSI. The wind load I mentioned uh, is a concern, but on top of that tower is a mass, is a tune mass damper that shifts, much like a high rise in the wind. And so um, there's always the story, I have to say, uh, that you can to tune mass damper, and the old story is uh, you can tune a piano, but you can't tune a fish. So, although I know I can't hear because the sound is turned off, that uh, it's a bad joke. But nonetheless, it's uh, three in the morning where I'm at. So, anyway, um, we're also going to be talking uh, in terms of the hybridization opportunities. Uh, but that solar receiver uh, is really the focus of what we do. Um, how it's controlled comes through something we call the Sphinx, or the Solar Field Integration and Control System. And as you can see, this is an image taken from the control tower at Ivanpah. And I should note that each tower is individually controlled, uh, meaning locally. Uh, we also have a central uh, control room that operates all three. So we have both local and, and centralized there. We also are able to remotely access and control the heliostat field from our engineering offices uh, and can do program changes at any time. So here, that system is constantly monitoring on a real-time basis, a combination of weather. Uh, it's looking at the cameras, providing feedback. It's making adjustments, including taking into account changes in the weather patterns. So we have our own weather, multiple weather stations across that area. Again, that's a very large area at 14.2 square kilometers, uh, which means that you'll have cloud cover over one uh, solar field area and perhaps not the other two. And so balancing that and determining the number of heliostats that are focused on the receiver at any given point in time uh, is what we're optimizing. It's, as I said, oftentimes, like an analogy, you're driving a truck with a heavy load in the back, and uh, if you happen to be going uphill, you've got to give it more gas to maintain a constant speed. And that's what we're solving for, is constant temperature, constant pressure, uh, in order to deliver the necessary steam conditions for the boiler, uh, I, sorry, for the turbine, and um, this is our proprietary optimization and software. Now, a big part uh, for any of these projects are, is job creation and skills development. Uh, it's something that d often distinguishes concentrating solar power projects from other types of, uh, let's say, a PV project. With respect to Ivanpah, we had more than 2,900 construction workers and support staff during the peak of construction. That is, uh, in addition to necessary management staff. There were 90 long-term operations maintenance jobs created by this project and generate about $300 million in state and local benefits for California. Over the life of the plant, total employee earnings are estimated to be about $650 million, with the bulk of those being earned during the project's construction. So what I mentioned what's sometimes different here is that the necessary skills are quite diverse. So uh, we're not looking solely at some electrical work, uh, maybe some grading and uh, connections, but instead you have the full complement of skills required to build a thermal power plant, uh, carpenters, uh, biologists and engineers, structural and civil pipe fitters, uh, technicians, electricians, code operators, plant operators. Um, they all have a role, and we're proud to say there's a number of things we did during the job that uh, helped. Particularly, BrightSource was committed to follow through on its commitments to local labor and skills development for previously disadvantaged communities. 
approximately 35% of the Ivanpah's craft labor workforce uh, was uh, Hispanic with the same percentage in craft and supervisory roles. And the project was proud to hire veterans as a part of what we call the Helmets to Hard Hats program, where returning veterans were able to get into an apprenticeship program and over the course of the construction complete that apprenticeship, which lasted two years. So it was not just uh, BrightSource itself and its partners, but certainly all the subcontractors as well. And it's important. It's uh, something that we, that we follow. Um, you'll also see on the previous picture, if you were looking carefully while I described, quite a variety of different people, including we had a lot of women that uh, worked on the project, about 10% of the workers uh, fit fitting jobs as pipe fitters, welders, um, and even uh, the folks who commissioned the plant during its operation phase. So labor being one important component, another is uh, what is the local impact on procurement? And so here for Ivanpah, you see in, in the blue uh, where we sourced components from the, from the United States. In our case, there were 18 states uh, that provided parts, whether it was a cone drive from uh, Minnesota or we got from Arizona, a factory that was established to serve and create and produce heliostats. Um, approximately 85% of the total contract value of Ivanpah, and the project cost $2.3 billion, 85% uh, of that contract value was captured in the United States. Um, there were about 22,000, I'm sorry, 22 million just key heliostat components, 30,000 tons of heliostat support steel, structural steel, which is about three times the total metal in the Eiffel Tower, and uh, over 2,000 kilometers of cable. Uh, but again, for the next design of the heliostats, we are actually, or have moved to a wireless control design. So we eliminate a lot of those cables, which uh, also helps to accelerate and reduce the construction schedule and reduce costs. Um, what you would find where, where South Africa is considering a solar park is that that long-term commitment to multiple projects does, in fact, attract and draw uh, the necessary capital investment in these support organizations. And just to, to sort of touch and, and finalize on the uh, the skills. These are skills, construction skills, that are applicable in any construction project, uh, certainly power industry and uh, thermal power plants. But again, that variety of construction and maintenance um, opportunity are skills that are extensible to other projects. So moving into the construction about the project, um, a few things. What you're seeing here on this slide off to the right is the construction of a air-cooled condenser. And you can see, maybe if you look closely, the bottom, so whether circles, those are the really giant fans uh, to condense the steam after it has gone through its cycles. Um, the plant itself was built in construction. Uh, off on the left-hand side, you'll note it is a, um, uh, a, a lattice structure. Uh, it was designed actually to use uh, jump cranes. Uh, we had three of the 15 world's jump cranes at this project for the first 18 months. And we were able to get to the height because it was the maximum load. And some of the construction techniques that involved really were pre-completing uh, pre and pre-installing as much of the piping on the ground. And then we're able to lift that up in stages, about nine stages in total, uh, as it said, to reach that 140-foot meter height. Um, so in the next, uh, who is responsible? Well, I've said before, BrightSource provided solar field supply, the heliostat control components, and that means also the quality control, uh, making sure the information, I'm sorry, the products are arriving on schedule, um, the heliostat assembly tools, BrightSource leased. Uh, the actual assembly, though, took place in a building I'll show you here in a moment by uh, workers from Bechtel. And the SIRSIG supply was Riley Power. BrightSource, I, I would note here, has its own special coating it uses on those, re, on those uh, tubes, those receiver tubes. Uh, the turbine for this example was Siemens uh, in South Africa. You'd be looking at Alstom. Uh, but other equipment and supply, again, the responsibility of Bechtel as that EPC contractor. So looking at the Heliostat building uh, on site, we constructed an automated assembly that was designed to produce 500 Heliostats per day. 
uh, the logistics management and storage. We can see component supply. We would have trucks come in and unload rail cars. So one of the nice locations here about this project, although what you're seeing off to the left, if you look to the west, was that desert landscape. Um, the project is actually located adjacent to a 36-hole golf course. Uh, across a major, there's a major highway that runs alongside uh, the area, and uh, within five miles you can see three casinos, a discount shopping mall, and a roller coaster. So people sometimes say, boy, this is in the middle of the pristine desert, if you read these types of stories. Uh, but in fact, it is an area that was previously disturbed, uh, that had been used for various uh, grazing applications. But it provided access to labor and also the housing that a lot of the workers stayed at the casinos at a discount rate. So it was uh, everyone worked out well in that example. The way, though, we, we focused on reducing costs was really to follow the Six Sigma Quality Control Program. Uh, meaning Six Sigma, uh, we tried to shoot for virtually being virtually free of defects or 99.9999 uh, accuracy. Uh, we use that to address all sorts of issues, including design, procurement, and construction challenges. And we focused on process improvements for uh, five major areas, the material handling, how, how materials came in and moved around the field. We even had to do time-based studies because across that 14 square kilometers, uh, you have to think about uh, restrictions on how fast a truck or workers can move. There was, a, uh, in some cases, 15 or 10 mile an hour speed limits in certain areas. And so calculating the time it takes to move from the heliostat assembly building out to the field, all of that was estimated and calculated. And so material handling, heliostat assembly, field transportation, solar field installation, and the power tower erection. Um, the team working together with, with, with labor, management and labor, constantly found new and more efficient ways that we drove performance from unit one to two to three. We saw meaningful, significant reductions in both the cost and time it took to uh, complete the construction work. So uh, you're, you're looking at now an image of what's called the heliostat pod pad bonding. These glass mirrors come in on a flatbed truck. Uh, they are then lifted and taken off, uh, put on this system where they apply pads. And this is how we attach the metal to the back of these pads. Again, a new design, we actually go to something more of a metal strip uh, in the back that uh, has an adhesive. But we installed millions of these pads, and they would be cured. But once they are ready, they are moved into the next section, which is the heliostat assembly building. And what you're seeing here is a 48,000 square foot building, uh, complete with a complex conveyor system, this automated machinery. I would best describe it as a automated, uh, like an automobile manufacturing assembly. And by the way, there are videos of how this operates on our website. You can always go and see, uh, get a good look at those. Um, but at peak, it assembled more than 500 heliostats per day. Now, I would say, just, this is one of the few areas with air conditioning. The outside working temperatures for a lot of these uh, days were 110 to 114 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, Daniel, I'll let you jump in and convert that uh, back to, uh, to Celsius right away. But nonetheless, this was a favorite place if you could get the job working inside the air conditioning factory. Um, but I'd also note here that with regard to automation, um, we've been asked, is it necessary? It really depends. Um, in California, there's very, very high labor costs, and so uh, the automation actually made sense. But in, in, in other places where we operate, it's not always a everything is automated. We look to ensure that we can hit those localization goals, that where labor uh, can be employed and employed effectively, uh, we do that. And so that's an, it's an important part of thinking that through. But in this example, um, it was three facilities we had to produce, and they had to produce uh, what were a total of 176,500 heliostats that went in. So uh, after they were done here at the factory, we'd take them out into the field. Um, you can see them being uh, transported here. Uh, we had to design these uh, transport carts and borrowed a lot of ideas from the agricultural industry. Uh, on the next slide, you can see a crew working on installing. And uh, going back to what I talked about, given the height, at this size and at this placement, it's relatively easy if you have to do uh, uh, any sort of maintenance work or make adjustments or, or uh, troubleshoot if that's a concern. But you can see a small crew is capable of getting that work done. And on the next slide, uh, you can see that we use teams of crews. 
Uh, I mentioned 176,500 heliostats. Uh, we did hit the goal of installing 500 heliostats a day, and the heliostat consists of those two mirrors, because what we're really calculating there is the surface area. Um, over the course of construction, once we broke ground and, and when we ended, uh, we installed an average of one heliostat per minute. And uh, think of that, uh, each heliostat is about enough to serve an average California home uh, per year. So although it's, we say 140,000 homes, it's 176,500 heliostats. And we had competitions between the team to see how well that could go. Uh, operation sure. maintenance is... Go ahead, Daniel. So just to, just to yep. let everyone know that um, we have received a few questions. And uh, a reminder to those who do want to ask some questions, uh, please feel free to send them through via the WebEx system. Uh, we are heading into the end of the presentation, and then we'll move into Q&A in a few minutes. Great. Thanks. Um, so nothing unusual here on operations. Uh, it breaks down that NRG, that is the managing partner, is responsible for power plant operations and the maintenance. We provide as bright source uh, continuing services related to the solar field integrated control system and software upgrades. Uh, we did uh, design some automated mirror washing equipment, although we also clean some of these mirrors manually, uh, and we provide warranties. And so that's uh, from the different respective manufacturers. So nothing unusual. Um, you're also seeing in the next slide uh, an image inside that air-cooled condenser. And so here, uh, the maintenance uh, is also a source of local jobs, the mirror washing, the scheduled maintenance, uh, and uh, other maintenance, including regulatory compliance maintenance. You, you, I'm sure you can imagine that there are extensive reporting requirements uh, for all the agencies that we work with. Now, I'm going to wrap up talking a little bit about the environmental approach that was employed for BrightSource. Um, you can see, looking at this image that on the ground, that we maintain the natural contours and the vegetation of the existing land. And likewise, in the back, uh, you can see the mountains. So as I said at the, at the beginning, this is a high desert area, which means that occasionally, when it rains, it will flood. And it, it comes down. And it comes down. And so these heliostats uh, that sit on these pylons, which are inserted into the ground, they are designed to withstand up to three feet of scouring over a 30-year period. And uh, just to show you how we were confident in the engineering, about three months into the initial construction when we had the pylons in the ground, we had a 70-year flood. Uh, we've also had 25-year uh, you know, electrical storms. Uh, it seems they all happen to show up in the first two years. But nonetheless, they did perform exactly as we would have hoped it would perform. So um, the responsibility, when we think about the design, it's a desert environment, water is a concern. So everything we look to do and how we approach the construction and operation really is designed to minimize impact on the ecosystem. And that includes the site selection. As I said, previously disturbed land. We had a natural gas pipeline that existed out there, uh, the existing transmission lines that were later upgraded. We look at the low-impact design, uh, water usage, air quality and species, and up on the left, that is the completed, uh, on the left-hand side of that image, the completed air-cooled condenser. And off to the right, you see uh, one of the biologists working in, along the tortoise fencing line, which is special fencing that prevents them from digging in. They're a, um, uh, a threatened species, not endangered, but threatened, and so a lot of sensitivity to that. Uh, the Construction, uh, you saw the pylons. Well, how do they get into the ground? We use a low-impact pylon driver. It's basically a tool that has an auger that would loosen the soil, and then uh, another arm would come over and vibrate that pylon uh, or post, if you want to call it, to down into the ground. And again, uh, get borrowing a lot from technologies that came out of the marine industry on piers and uh, setting uh, positions in water. Uh, that's uh, how we sort of came up with a lot of those approaches a lot of which have been patented. Um, but this process can el eliminate the need for foundations and uh, concrete pads and uh, vegetation coexisting uh, beneath, beneath, that, uh, beneath that area. It does translate into savings. The next slide I have is talking a little bit about the land use comparison. And just a note I'd like to make here. Uh, first, when people think about a project like Ivanpah, they often say, boy, that's a lot of land. Um, what does that mean? And, I only like to remind folks that when you think of, uh, say, oil or natural gas or nuclear, 
you have to consider all of the upstream impacts associated with exploration, extraction, processing, transportation, fuel conversion before you get to delivery. And you have all of that occurring in one place. So actually, solar is very land use efficient. In fact, you don't have mountaintop mining removal. You don't have to go through the sheer volumes of uh, soil required to identify and, and then enrich uranium. And certainly, if you're talking about um, nuclear, you don't have the long-term waste disposal, nor do you have projects that uh, are of the 10 billion 15 billion size, you can build these incrementally and you know, 150, 200 uh, megawatts at a time to scale up and, and do it uh, quickly and responsibly. So I, I always want to draw people's attention to the fact that uh, you have all those other impacts typically hidden. It's not just the natural gas power plant that's there. Um, safeguarding air quality, this goes without saying. Uh, this is one of the reasons that South Africa has looked at uh, uh, CSP, uh, its ability to use dry cooling to avoid the not just the uh, CO2 emissions, but also criteria pollutants uh, that contribute to um, uh, a healthy, healthy atmosphere. And so just a short comparison there. And then lastly, uh, we are at the very end. And I'm going to turn this over to Daniel, who um, has a few things to say. And I, I think, Daniel, you also have control of the questions. So that's it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for that, Joe. Uh, it was very interesting. And uh, um, I certainly learned some more new, new information as well. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, a couple of questions have come in from some uh, listeners. Um, uh, but uh, in just a minute, we'll, we'll, we'll address them, as I said. Um, this is a, the first of a series of webinars that uh, we've aimed to share our experience and engage with um, various stakeholders here in South Africa uh, and globally. So uh, we will be in touch uh, with everyone on the scheduled dates for the next webinar series. So please, uh, please look out for that. Um, moving on to the questions, uh, I have my colleague, Saheed Akubiejo. Uh, who's our Business Development Associate based here in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, I'm going to ask Sahid to help us uh, with uh, addressing some of the questions. Sahid, um, yeah, I see some of the you know, interesting questions that uh, very often we're asked. Um, the first one here is, how does CSP compete with wind and PV? Um, would you like to give us a, a, an insight into that? Uh, definitely. Uh, thanks a lot, Daniel. Um, I think it's a very good question. Um, as Joe mentioned earlier, that the key value proposition for CSP is, is storage. Um, so essentially, um, CSP plants with thermal storage can, in principle, provide this virtual electricity and all other electric power products and services provided by conventional flexible um, thermal power plants in the way that PV and wind cannot. And this is actually um, the, the next um, 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 topic for for the next webinar, which we're going to hold in a couple of in a couple of weeks from now, um, and during this webinar, we will go into more detail on the value of thermal storage and the different um, storage mediums available. And we welcome everyone to join us um, with this webinar. Sure. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sahid. Yeah. And um, another another question here uh, in terms of the the future going forward. You know, we we've learned a lot at Ivanpah, uh, as Joe has mentioned. Um, but see here, there is certainly a question about how, how, how can CSP reduce costs? Is it still possible? Where, where do you see the future in terms of cost reduction, Sahid? Uh, so this is another good question. Um, and I think that, yes, definitely, there's a lot of opportunity for cost reduction. As we know that um, technology cost reduction comes from factors such as you know, um, economies of scale, that is building um, larger plants and increasing um, steam temperature and um, pressure efficiencies. Um, increasing capacity factors through storage and um, um, supply chain and, and other technology improvements. And, and we as Brightsource, for instance, have achieved significant cost reduction in recent times through supply chain and technology improvements. And, and for example, uh, between Ivanpah and Ashalim, we've, we've achieved 20% um, cost reduction on uh, the solar field by powering our heliostat using small PV panels and eradicating the use of um, electric cables. Uh, in South Africa, for instance, we can easily achieve 15% uh, cost reduction in levelized cost of electricity if, for instance, if we allowed to build a 150 megawatt plant instead of a 100 megawatt plant. So, so definitely a significant cost reduction is achievable, uh, especially with CSP tower technology. 
Yeah, great. Thanks, Sahid. And certainly um, they're very interesting. There's, there's a lot we can talk about. As I said, uh, we, we will have uh, future webinars to discuss in more detail these topics. Um, I see there's a whole bunch of questions that have come through. I do apologize. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to answer all of the questions, but we'll try uh, um, just to wrap up with one, one more. Um, in terms of a uh, question around cleaning heliostats, um, so how, how, many, how often do we have to clean them? Uh, originally, we thought uh, once every couple of weeks. Um, it turns out and, uh, that, that uh, we're, on average, cleaning the heliostats about once every two to three months. So um, it's quite, uh, again, there you see Daniel, a, a um, let me just there. Daniel, let me just jump in on that. Um, it is, uh, in the case of Ivanpah, it is of only about three times a year. It's probably worth noting we have a separate area within our solar field. I mentioned the weather stations. We also have what we call uh, mini heliostats where we monitor the accumulation of dust in a given area uh, to determine what the reduction in reflectivity is. And that's factored into the necessary or the number of heliostats that are required um, in general to produce uh, sufficient flux onto the surface of the boiler. But when you get to a place like Morocco, it's much more frequent. You have to clean it, you know, um, almost uh, once every three weeks, uh, about 19, 20 times a year. Um, so it's a factor that varies. Um, and likewise, you know, uh, how, how you clean them is um, you have the choices between a combination of uh, manual uh, labor and uh, some uh, automated uh, cleaning system. But I'd add it's always recycled water, always recycled water. Great. Thanks, Joe. And um, I think we'll wrap it up with the last question, which uh, – uh, Joe, you, you could probably take care of, uh, uh, there's been a lot of discussion in the media around uh, a, the impact of uh, birds um, by, the, uh, by the design, the tower design in particular. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion. Just recently we got a, a, um, a positive outcome from our permitting process. Perhaps, uh, Joe, if you could just highlight a few points and how, do you, how did we address the avian concerns? Sure. Um, well, we, we obviously uh, take all the avian, uh, but all species issues into account on the front end. And in the example of Ivanpah, the early issue was concern about the desert tortoise. Uh, and that actually has turned out to be a very successful program where um, we have a head start and uh, we're able to actually, the survival rate of the tortoises and the translocation has been a tremendous success and the project is actually returning more into the valley than if there had been no project at all. Slightly different with avian. So first, you know, it's important that people understand on tower you do have reflected sunlight, which is called flux, or and it's measured in you know, watts per square, square meter here. The, um, the issue is that as you get closer to the tower, that the concentrated levels can cause damage. I mean, remember, you're designing this to heat and create high temperature, high pressure seam. But there's a few things I would point out. One, first, let me say that the stories that we have seen in the press are uh, wildly inaccurate and wildly exaggerated. And I'll give you the best example is the Associated Press ran a story that got coverage that was quoting a project opponent. This is on another project we've been working on. I quoted a project opponent a witness who said that he thought 28,000 birds would uh, die as a result of this. Well, um, you can imagine that there are very rigorous protocols required uh, for the Ivanpah project and in the first six months of operation. And by the way, these are protocols that require you go out. We have to search 100% coverage of the area, 850 feet from the tower. We do 100% coverage along the transmission line, 100% coverage along the uh, fence line. We have stratified samples to ensure statistically valid information. And in the first six months of operation, there were 321 avian fatalities, of which 133 were related or had evidence of some singeing. Um, and of those, they only occur within, uh, I think, 94% occurred within 240 meters of the tower. So it's an area, it's something that's limited to there. Uh, two things, uh, I would say. 133 is a far cry from the opponent's claim of uh, annualized six months, 14,000. And so we recognize you do have to make adjustments, but they go out, they use teams of dogs to ensure high efficiency and, and that they're getting. So that's the, the first thing is that the impacts are 
comparable, I would say, on a per gigawatt hour basis or a slightly less than wind. But they still are a very small relative to other sources of avian impacts. And in the U.S., uh, that can be, um, a, uh, I should say, free-ranging, what they call a feral cat on federal land. But feral cats account for 3.4 billion, that's a billion with a B, bird deaths per year. Um, buildings are estimated to cause 1 billion. Um, you kind of can run down the list of uh, transmission lines and several hundred million, uh, all the way down to oil, uh, nuclear, coal facilities. And then it really gets very, very small uh, for wind, just because there's more wind deployed uh, these days, which is about 320,000 for the entire U.S. Uh, and then with respect to solar, it's uh, so far in the hundreds. So that, that just, uh, it, it's an area recognized what goes on in the U.S. press has a lot to do with uh, permitting process. And Daniel, you mentioned, but for folks on the phone, um, after a, a recommendation to uh, necessarily uh, to pause, we received a positive recommendation uh, taking into account a wealth of information that was developed in the record regarding not just avian behavior, but modeling and statistics, uh, but also uh, identification of a range of deterrent technologies. And so everything from moving the positioning of the heliostats helps to reduce the standby uh, flux intensity in certain areas, uh, but also keeping knowing that it's close to the tower. Uh, but, but we do know it's a small part, but it's not the only. You, you have interest, avian impacts come with any project, whether it's a solar or wind or it's a PV project. Uh, it's just that there's an old phrase. Um, well, the phrase is important, but Ivanpah being the first get a lot, gets a lot of the attention. Uh, but the good news is, much like the tortoise, there were concerns, and that has been a success. We're confident that the steps and measures being taken will help to minimize this. And on balance, you're really thinking about the importance of renewable energy, clean uh, the, the air, the avoided emissions, reduction in water consumption. And so uh, to on balance and addressing climate concerns, it's, uh, the renewable energy clearly is, uh, is the way to go. But um, for those interested, as I said, there's a wealth of information uh, and new science that has come out uh, that previously wasn't available. And uh, we feel very good about and encouraged by the California Energy Commission's decision last Friday to say, OK, uh, uh, having weighed all that evidence, we recommend that you uh, go forward with your next project. So that's uh, that's the quick update there. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Joe. That was uh, very informative as well. And uh, just wrapping up, as I see, we have reached the end of our 45 minutes. And uh, just to end off, I'd like to let uh, our listeners know that um, we we are going to be sending you an email with a link to uh, a high definition digital photo book of the of the photos of Ivan Parr, um from from our famous uh, uh, photographers. And, uh, and then also, um, if you can, please just take some time to respond to the survey that will be sent through to you to evaluate our, uh, how we did here at the webinar today. Um, we certainly take into account your feedback. Uh, we'd like to continue developing this as a series, an ongoing series, um, and really value your input and in involvement. So, um, so with that, yeah, I'd like to thank everybody for attending and participating. Thank you so much for uh, Joe, who is um, in California, and uh, it's the middle of the night there, so we really do appreciate you, Joe, for, for joining us. Um, My pleasure. Yeah. And, yeah, no, thank you. And, and to Saheed also for your input. And uh, there's a lot of people behind the scenes who we won't mention who, who have helped us put this uh, very exciting uh, webinar together. So I'd like to thank you as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so to everyone, thanks. And until next next time, thank you, and um, be well. Have a good have a good day. Thank you.